Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. We're recording today on July 8th, 2015, and your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Radio, and please give us feedback. You can leave us a review on iTunes, contact us on Twitter, that's podcast under init, send us an email at hosts at podcastinit.com, or leave a comment on our show notes. We donate our time to you because we love Python and its community. If you would like to return the favor, you can send us a donation. There's a link to our site in the show notes. Everything that we don't spend on producing the show will be donated to the PSF to keep the community alive. Today we're interviewing Holger Krekel about his work on PyTest. Holger, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, yes, hello. Hello Tobias, hello Chris. Very great talking to you. I'm involved with Python since like, I don't know, 15 years or so. And I'm, besides like being heavily into programming since about 25 or even longer, Yes, I'm also a father, so I spend a lot of time with my child and run a small consultancy and give some trainings also on PyTest and other tools. And yeah, otherwise, uh, feel free to ask some some more background questions. I could, of course, go on for a lot uh, for a while. I'm also giving talks uh, at conferences a lot. Uh, I've been to almost every EuroPython and, and PyCon in the US. And you're keynoting this um, year for EuroPy. Very exciting. Yes, I'm keynoting. But I, I think I already did this like two or three years ago in, uh, for EuroPython and a couple of other conferences. So it's not completely new to me, although I'm looking forward to this year's edition. Great. So in the vein of background, uh, I know you alluded to it just a moment ago, but how did you get started to, in Python? How were, you, how were you introduced to the language? That was around 2000. I was, I was doing C++ and Java and, and wanted to program an HTTP proxy, got completely lost in the Java documentation on how you do I.O. And then for the fun of it, I just, because I had heard about Python from somewhere, I just tried Jython and, and tried to use that. And to my, to my surprise, it took me only, I don't know, a, a, day, a day maybe, or even less than a day to get uh, more or less the HTTP proxy I wanted to have running, working. And I had spent like two or three days with Java, which I knew at the time, uh, unsuccessfully getting it to work. The way I wanted it, so that kind of like kicked me off because I, I liked the language very much uh, in terms of, of how it worked and the ease of programming that it provided to me. So, what inspired you to create PyTest, and how did the existing unit test framework play into the story? I got introduced to testing and also agile programming around two thousand one, I think, when I joined the Zope community, which had already a tradition of sprinting and of writing tests first. And at that time we actually used, um, I was only briefly involved there, but we used unit test. And indeed, I didn't like uh, the boilerplate. And I thought, well, if there's so many things in, in Python that are so easy and straightforward to use, why is unit test so cumbersome? It appeared to me like this. It didn't appear to me like to be in the spirit of how, how Python uh, actually works and felt to me. So that's when I got into the idea of, of uh, writing something that doesn't require boilerplate and allows to write tests very in a very straightforward manner. And I found like it only took a couple of hundred lines of code to actually get a nice first testing tool working. It wasn't called PyTest at the time. It was called uTest or something. Uh, it got renamed like twice, I think, since then. So that was around 2003, I guess. And the name PyTest actually, I think, started in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, in the context of PyPy, which is a project I also co-founded, um, the just-in-time compiler for Python. And we used testing from the start, and we used PyTest from the start. And actually, many of the improvements that followed from uh, in, the, in the upcoming years actually were inspired from the needs we had from PyPy, which nowadays has something like 20,000 tests. 
Wow, that's definitely a lot of tests. And keeping tests fast, particularly when you have that many, is very difficult. Are there any aspects of PyTest that lend themselves to keeping tests fast? I think in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, we introduced already, maybe even 2005 at the end, we introduced distributed testing. That means that you can distribute the running of tests to multiple processes, either, either on your own machine or to remote machines. So that's something how you, how we sped up running of tests that each might only take like zero dot something seconds. But if you have like hundreds or thousands of them, um, there's not really much that the test framework can do to speed up other than this kind of distribution. So, and that has been with PyTest, the so-called Xdist, the distribution plugin has been there since that time and got improved all the time. Yeah, I've definitely been seeing a lot of particularly hosted continuous integration systems that are supporting distributing your tests among multiple processes or multiple instances in order to get them to complete faster. So it's interesting that Xdist has been part of the PyTest framework for so long. There are many different styles of testing, such as behavior-driven development, unit testing, integration testing, functional testings. Uh, what attributes of PyTest make it suitable or unsuitable for these different approaches? Well, as far as I can tell, it's used for all of these different kinds of testing. Myself, I use it for like very small unit tests, but also very large and slow functional testing. And certainly people are using it for behavior-driven testing as well, and all kinds of testing approaches, actually. PyTest has a bit of a model that does not, maybe a bit unlike unit test, that does not mandate writing fast-running tests or uh, small-scale unit tests. What are your views on black box testing, and how would someone use PyTest to implement this approach? I'm using it a lot. I mean, black box testing refers to the idea that you don't actually test particular fine-grained code path in your system, but you just invoke the whole system and you, for example, perform HTTP requests, and you don't care how the code satisfying your request is actually internally structured. So you make assertions on the whole behavior. And I'm, I'm doing this a lot, actually, because I, I think uh, there's a lot of value in, in functional testing, because it allows you to express assertions about the behavior that you actually want to have uh, towards the outside world. And the way how you use PyTest for that is that you typically create so-called fixtures. Um, and fixture functions can can be scoped on, like you can create them each time you use them, or you can reuse them throughout the whole testing process. So for example, if you have some kind of heavy database object or so with some initialized tables you need in order to test your application, you can put this into a fixture and then tell PyTest to use the same base database for all of your tests. That's called a session scope for your fixture. And PyTest makes this very easy. So the, the, the main support that PyTest has for functional black box testing is to have a very flexible fixture system that allows to cache your fixtures across different scopes up to the whole test run scope. And you mentioned using a database as an example for potentially loading your fixture data into. Does PyTest have the ability to reset that database for every, te for every test? Because I know that sometimes there are issues with isolating the scope of your tests that can lead to unpredictable outcome in your test, particularly if, there's a, if, if they're run in different orders. Sure. Well, isolation is certainly something that is of paramount importance for uh, writing any kind of test, especially functional tests. And as far as I know, PyTest Django, uh, a plugin for the Django framework, does that. So it offers options to actually have uh, have your tests isolated and your um, database state reset for each test. And it's basically a matter of how you program your fixtures. 
because in the fixture you can not only say this is how my you not only provide an object but you can also say um, every time a test actually uses it please call me when that test has finished so I can clean up and reset the state but this resetting of the state is uh, application specific and that's why you need to write this kind of finalizer or reset function yourself. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the fixture plugin or framework for PyTest has callbacks supported so that you can hook into different events in the life cycle of the test in the fixture? Exactly. So you can say, I have this um, database object that I'm going to reuse across the whole test suite. And then for each test function, I'm going to provide a database object that is actually the session scoped one. I mean, the one that I'm reusing throughout the whole session. But then I'm also adding a callback and saying each time a test finishes using this fixture, I'm going to reset the state. And you can actually express this very briefly within the fixture system that is part of the PyTest core. And are there other aspects of PyTest that support that event-based callback? There's lots of um, lots of events you can react to. The whole plugin system is of PyTest, which offers something like 40 different hooks. And these are basically events that you can subscribe to, that you can, can get called back on. And with this, all of the, I don't know, 150 plugins or so that we currently have, they all implement these handlers. They're not only event subscriptions, because some of these, what we call hooks, they are actually tasked with implementing functionality. So it's not just a pure event in the sense of a read-only thing where you just do something, do some additional logging or something, but actually these hooks are called by PyTest to perform, for example, the execution of a test function or the setup of the fixtures and so on. And you can actually overtake this or you can do additional things um, in front of it. So it's a bit more than just an event system. It's it's really, PyTest is decomposed into lots of hook functions that are called and that are implemented then by the plugins to provide the specific additions and extra behaviors that you want to see. That definitely sounds like a very powerful architecture for PyTest and sounds like it would give you a lot of capabilities that aren't necessarily offered by, for instance, unit test, having the ability to plug into all those different points in the execution of the code and being able to add in or remove different components that you may or may not need. Yeah, I think that's one of the, compared to unit test, I mean, Nose, with this, which is another popular testing framework, also um, has plugins. I'd say that um, we kind of managed to have a very good compatibility story in terms of plugins. So the way how the hook system is designed makes it somewhat easy to maintain compatibility over the years to all of the existing plugins. So there's a number of plugins that are five years old or four years old, and they still work. That's very impressive. So I've been hearing a lot about property-based testing, which was popularized by the Quick Check module in Haskell. Does PyTest support anything like that? Yes, there's a number of people who, who, who use it. There's a so-called PyTest minus Quick Check plugin, which mimics, I think, most of what you can do with the um, Haskell parallel. Uh, I'm not using it very much myself, but I've played with it. But it's there if you want to... Um, go for this kind of like sending random data to your API. That's very interesting. I know that there's another library called Hypothesis that is supposed to mirror the functionality of QuickCheck within Python. What would be involved in getting that plugged into PyTest? I'm not quite sure. I think that I think there is some integration. I can't remember the details currently on, on Hy Hypothesis and, and PyTest. At least there was some communication between the author of that and some PyTest contributors. But you would have to check on that. I mean, generally, people using PyTest, they prefer to have one framework and then plug in lots of other things. And uh, I think that would be the way to go, actually. If Hypothesis offers interesting functionality, then the way to integrate this would be to write a plugin. And in fact, someone already has. I, I checked uh, really quick while you folks were talking. And in fact, there is a, 
a hypothesis pi test plugin. So that problem is already solved. Probably yes. I mean, it's always you have to know that some of the plugins. I mean, some of the plugins are heavily maintained and they get released often. Some of the plugins in PyTest, and that's I think also true for Node, Nose, they have been released, but they're not really maintained very well. So you always have to check a bit uh, if there's actual activity and if, if it works nice enough for you. I think that's sort of par for the course with any sort of open source technology that you might want to adopt, right? You always have to kick the tires and build it, play with it, make sure it, it serves your needs. So do you think the characteristics and nature of the unit testing framework being used have any effect on the number and quality of tests developers write? Well, there have been many people, um, there are some quotes on the PyTest.org website, there have been many examples where people say that they find it a lot more fun to, to write tests uh, with PyTest, uh, also because of the reporting and also because of the reduction in boilerplate compared to unit test. And I think that if that's true and that's what many people feel like, then I, I would I would guess that indeed it, it will help people to actually write more and better tests. So the quality of a testing tool certainly has influence on how much you like to write tests and how much you modify your tests and advance your tests. And that's one of the ideas of PyTest, especially the fixture system and, and some other aspects, really is that we want to make it, we want to encourage people to actually uh, refactor their tests to make them easier to maintain and to extend. So it's it's a bit like with applications and libraries themselves. I mean, you also want to have applications and, and libraries be easy, easy to refactor and the tests shouldn't stand in the way, but also support restructuring your application. And that's something that we, uh, that many people in the writing PyTests find uh, easier to do with PyTest than uh, to do with unit test. So is there ever a time when you advise against writing unit tests? Are there any situations where writing tests might just be a waste of time or might cause potential issues? Well, it's, Yes, I mean, I can tell when I don't write tests, which is usually when I'm encountering a problem and I'm not really sure how to solve it. And then I typically first play around. I don't write a test, but I actually play around with the application. I do manual testing, basically, um, to explore. So basically, when I'm exploring something, uh, exploring a solution, if something actually might work, I'm not uh, necessarily writing a test first. But I'm rather trying to, to see what the solution actually looks like overall, especially if it involves changing like five different places in the application. And once I get this to work, then I go back and then I actually know how to, how to fix it. And then I go back and try to write a test for it and, and then like implement the proper solution. And that, that's often, sometimes I do it with um, partners in, in projects that I just, do a pull request on without any tests and just ask for feedback like do you think this is like the right way to go about this problem and when the when the answer basically we discuss that a bit and once we actually agree on let's do it this way then we actually go for writing the tests and the actual implementation so i would say for exploration of solutions it's often if you don't really know how to do something and want to understand the behavior of the system then uh, writing tests first can be very cumbersome and, and slow you down unnecessarily. What are some signs that you watch out for when writing tests that tell you that a particular feature needs to be refactored? That's usually when I when I find that my my test code is fragile. So I change little bits in my application or library and suddenly I have to change lots of places in my tests. That's usually something where I step back and try to refactor the tests to the point where it's not necessary anymore to have like many changes uh, in the tests, but just like um, like two or three places. So it's basically the idea that when you go from one to n or one to two, basically, you, you have something like for one particular situation, 
and then you find you need to write a test for a different situation, but which is very similar. It has only maybe like one or two things that it does different in the setup and so on. Then I try to refactor the test so that I can factor out the, the common parts and have the tests focus only on the on the different parts. Um, and that's basically something that arises out from experience. It's not something that you can put into an easy recipe. But I think it's like once you repeat yourself, once you actually see that you're doing the same things, like you're basically copy pasting a test to another test and just rename the test and then change like two or three lines. That's for example, when you, when you need to do something like this, it's a sign that you could spend some time on refactoring, especially when you do it like a third and a fourth time. Then latest, it makes sense to factor it out. Because if the way how you actually constructing your test then changes because your application structure changes, you will have many tests that you need to change uh, with possibly very subtle differences and that's not fun anymore. So uh, repetition is uh, also in tests something to be avoided just as much as in a regular application or library. For someone who is converting their existing unit tests from the unit test slash nose style to use PyTest in an idiomatic manner, what are some of the biggest differences to be aware of? And I think for the, like most, when I give trainings and people actually run their test suites, it's usually, there's usually not much prohibiting actually just using PyTest there. Sometimes there's, there's an old concept called, gener which actually PyTest introduced like way back, which is called generator-based testing or yield-based testing, where you can have a test function that actually yields other test functions. And that's that's something where PyTest actually a couple of years ago said, we are not, it's, it like has all kinds of complexities that evolve from that uh, in the internal PyTest core and also has limitations on how you can actually use it. And in PyTest, we introduced parameterized testing and for the old style, we still support it but it's not documented anymore. And I think that in NOS, for example, the yield-based testing along with very particular fixture semantics or setup teardown semantics, that's still something that is used there. And I think that PyTest is not trying very much to mimic every detail there. But NOS 2, for example, what Jason Pellerin, the author of NOS, started, I think, two years ago, they also uh, got rid of this yield-based testing because it is actually a somewhat difficult concept. So that's one area. If you have lots of these tests, then there's a bit of work involved if you actually want to stay with the current way how to do things. Although even then, uh, mostly it just works. You're not going to drop this support very soon, although we might drop it, well, some point in like, I don't know, in a couple of years or so. So when you do new test projects, then definitely don't use it. Well, other things I'm not actually aware. Of. Usually when we, when you use regular features of nose or unit test and you find that PyTest cannot run it, we usually treat it as a bug in PyTest to fix. So if people report it and it's not like super arcane or something, then it usually gets fixed in PyTest, even to this day. So it's um, something I would say that PyTest still aims to, to be very compatible there. So has the strict backwards compatibility policy presented any interesting technical challenges thus far? Oh, certainly. Being backward compatible, including to the plugins, is quite some effort. And it requires careful thinking when you introduce new features on how you don't, that, that you don't disrupt uh, and, and introduce errors for existing test suites uh, for previous PyTest versions. And it's, well, I think it's, the thing is that t a testing tool is really such a core part of infrastructure, unlike like, like a particular application or even a library, that you don't really want the test tool to become incompatible that can be avoided at all. Because, I mean, PyTest certainly has something like tens of thousands of test suites uh, that exist that are that can use the current PyTest version. So even if you introduce an incompatibility, 
for just like 1% of people, it's going to be a lot of projects actually that, that have problems. It is, of course, it's much more complicated for the PyTest contributors to to keep this kind of compatibility. And there have been lots of discussions to actually drop it uh, here and there, but usually we manage to actually maintain it and fix any um, regressions. And I think again that the internal hook architecture and the fixture system, how it's done, actually make this easier. Although I wouldn't mind actually being able to drop some long deprecated features. But whenever you do that for a large scale project, it's uh, it's of course going to cause some pain. I mean, Python 3 being the case, in <laughs> the case everybody knows about, but uh, even with smaller changes, you're always going to lose some people. And we try to avoid that, even if it means that it's more effort for maintaining it. PyTest supports execution of tests written with other frameworks. How much ongoing maintenance does this feature require as changes are made to the other implementations? You mean um, the fact that you can run non-Python tests with, with PyTest? Well, that and also if there are changes in how unit test or nose executes or adds or removes features, what additional work does it make for you and the other maintainers of PyTest? Usually not that much, because even nose and unit test have exactly the same compatibility pressure, basically. People don't, people don't enjoy uh, nose changing its behavior, or unit test for that matter. And that's why the changes that we have to track from unit test and nose, they're usually not hard to keep up with. The web page says that PyTest is designed to work with domain-specific and non-Python tests. And in fact, a coworker is using it to test a Node.js project. How did PyTest design enable this? The general thing in, in PyTest is that there's a, there's a collection tree model that represents your test suite. And that is not Python specific. So basically you have like a normal tree, like a, like a typical like a programming a tree used in, in programming data structures. Um, it means that, for example, all the test functions and also the test classes that you have in Python, they are just mapped into this tree. And the running of tests is then kind of is on this tree. It's not directly on the Python function. We call this uh, test nodes and test, uh, test collectors and test uh, items, basically, in the internal model that is also used by the plugins. And people have been writing, for example, uh, a PyTest C and C++ plugin, so where they run their C and C++ tests using PyTest. So the model is not tight. The, this kind of like internal model on how the tests are represented is kind of independent from Python, um, from testing Python functions. There are a few hooks that are specific to just Python tests and also the fixture system. But in general, you can have, you can express your tests and some people do this in, in YAML, like all kinds of data formats. Even there's, I even know one company who used it for, they actually use PyTest in conjunction with Excel. So they actually, you, you provide some kind of file that contains tables in, in Microsoft Excel. And then it goes there and gets the data from there and, and like uses the PyTest reporting and, and things to actually uh, run the tests. So that's something that is just that dropped out of the model that we don't internally in the data structure that we have in PyTest, we don't talk too much about Python functions, but we actually talk about test items. And a test item has a run test method. So if you are a plugin, you just provide a different kind of item that provides a certain run test method, and then you're good to go and integrate non-Python test items uh, into your test run. Having the data structure being the unifying layer between different plugins or different interfaces with other languages seems to be a pretty popular paradigm that I've seen used in SaltStack and also most recently in NeoVim that allows people to use whatever language they feel comfortable with to write plugins and interface with a given tool without necessarily having to work within the same language. So that's definitely very interesting that PyTest adopted that approach as well and seeing the capabilities that that has enabled other people to take advantage of. Yes, I think so as well. It's of course, I mean, you still need to, when you write plugins, like unlike uh, SaltStack or other things, um, the plugins are actually written in Python. 
So even that person who, who implemented the C++ testing plugin, this person had to write plugin in Python. You couldn't just use C++. So it's kind of, in that sense, it's, it's limited. It is still a Python framework and all the plugins are implemented in Python. And in that sense, it's a bit different from maybe more general tools like Salt. What are some of the most interesting applications of PyTest that you have seen? Well, I think this C++ was got me by surprise, actually. I can, I'm not sure if I can quickly find the link now, but you should be able to if you look for Python C++ test runner or so. That was surprising. Another thing that was surprising at the time was being able to run JavaScript tests. There's a plugin called OEJS Kit, which is kind of an old plugin. I'm not sure if it's maintained very much anymore, but that I found surprising and that you, well, you can just write JavaScript files and tests and then have them talk to your whiskey application. And these tests actually run in the browser, but everything is reported back to the command line to PyTest. So that I found uh, quite an interesting approach at the time. Otherwise, generally, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by what kind of plugin ideas people come up with. I think the the main advantage of a flexible plugin system is that people come up with usages that you haven't thought about before. And I mentioned these two plugins. There's also several other plugins where I read what they actually implemented and I was a bit surprised that they could do that by using a certain combination of, of hooks. So I think that's really the thing about a good plugin system that it allows usages that go beyond what the original hook authors or, or plugin that the, the core people actually envision. Can you give us some examples of some plugins that are particularly cool or made novel use of those hooks? Well, I think the PyTest BDD, which is well-maintained plugin, is, is one good example. The like I, like I mentioned, I mean, the Py, PyTest uh, C++ uh, is, a, is a very funny plugin. There's all kinds of reporting enhancement plugins, for example, PyTest Sugar, which kind of like introduces all kinds of colors and whatnot for reporting. And it's... It's a bit hard to actually pinpoint. I mean, there's, there's like, it depends a bit on, if I talk about reporting, there's, there, there's many plugins in terms of, of, of modifying the reporting of PyTest and then the integration of other languages. Um, and it's a bit, it really depends on, on what I'm aiming at when I talk about what I find interesting. So I think I mentioned the plugins that I, that surprised me. I would need to, to look again through all the plugins because there's really too many to just uh, keep them in my head. So even if I, if I, if I had like two years ago, I, I might have uh, been surprised at something, but I might have forgotten now. So Those are some really good examples that our listeners can go check out if they're interested in seeing some of the depth and breadth of what PyTest can offer them in their, in their testing work. Yes, and we do actually try, I mean, just for the record, uh, if you go to PyTest.org and then the plugins page, there's like lots of plugins that are listed and even tested in conjunction with new PyTest releases. That's some work that Bruno Oliveira from Brazil has doing has been doing. So he basically takes all of the plugins from from PyPI from the package index and tries to run them against the release that we are preparing so that people can see if it works on Python 2 and Python 3 and the short descriptions and so on. So we actually try to get some kind of minimum quality there. But it, of course, it also depends on the plugin if it actually provides tests itself that we can run. That's a very nice dedication to your users and community of people who take advantage of PyTest to make sure that there is that visibility as to how well supported in the newest version a given plugin is, because I'm sure there are lots of people who rely on a number of different plugins in their day-to-day -day use of PyTest, and being able to have that quick verification that a new version coming out isn't going to break their tests all of a sudden or cause them to have any issues with the different plugins that they're using, or if there is an incompatibility being able to fix that ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. It's basically the, the contributors of PyTest, I mean, the main people actually doing PRs and, and, and maintaining PyTest nowadays, they all, of course, they each use all kinds of plugins. Myself, I would say I'm regularly using something like 10 different plugins. So if I'm developing, if I'm working on the new version of PyTest, I will instantly recognize it anyway if there's some kind of breakage. And I think it's very similar for the other contributors. So I guess we have probably a closure of maybe 30 plugins that are used by the actual 
people preparing a release, so um, so that they are kind of uh, guaranteed to work. But there's of course lots of other plugins we don't know about or we don't use for whatever reason. Yeah, we try to actually get some some kind of quality testing in there. Although I think that it's really, I mean, that that requires to make this like really good. Requires, I think, one or two week of dedicated work to just focus on this particular area of, of testing and reporting and maybe filing filing bugs. So it's always has to be balanced with the actual time that people can make for for doing PyTest improvements. I also think there's a benefit there in terms of the psychology of adoption, right? You know, it benefits your project as well, because if I'm someone who uses a particular plugin and I notice that in your new release, that plugin is broken and it clearly says that on the dashboard, then I might very well say, well, gee, I could probably dive in and fix that. I think that surprises hurt adoption. It's really tough when you download the new release and you use your plugin that you use every day and it blows up in your face. Whereas if you see a thing on a dashboard that says, hey, this isn't working, it's like your whole outlook towards that situation changes, I think. Exactly. Yes. And it's like there's a saying that for every uh, 10 or even 100 people who experience a problem in using your tool or session with a plugin, there's only going to be one person who actually reports it. So for every person who reports a certain problem or incompatibility, you can usually assume there's lots more who just took this as as stopping the, the try, right? They just went there and tried it and it didn't work and then they move on to something else. But it's of course, yeah, it's effort to, to, to get this kind of smooth beginning experience because a testing tool is really used in all kinds of different situations and projects and directory layouts and in all kinds of different ways. So there's a lot actually to be done in terms of uh, avoiding surprises. And it's, a, it's an ongoing effort actually. We, we are still trying to reduce the number of surprises you can possibly get. Is that dashboard visible to the public at this point or is it a work in progress? It should be visible, yes. Uh, I'm a bit... Let me just see if it's. It might not be. Might not be prominently. Uh, there's a link called Third Party Plugins on the PyTest Org website. If you go there, then you will see the plugins index. Continuing the conversation of adoption, do you have any sense as to the relative use of PyTest versus unit test or nose? And what do you, as the project creator and maintainer, and also the broader PyTest community, do to evangelize and make other people aware of PyTest's existence and why you might want to use it versus some of the other options? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm personally I'm pretty happy with uh, the usage, and of course there can, can always be more users, but uh, it's not like I'm trying very much actually to get more users to PyTest. That being said, Brianna Laffer from Australia, she was instrumental in doing something called Adopt PyTest Month, which we did in April 2015, where we paired volunteers, we had something like 15 volunteers, with open source projects that wanted to migrate to PyTest. And that was, a, I think, a, quite a success. And there's a, there's a talk at EuroPy from 2015 now in two weeks about how this went. So that was like a major effort to get some more publicity and so on. And otherwise, it's, I think, word of mouth. And hearing from others, like uh, also this podcast and, and other bits about the possibility to use PyTest and to give it a try. In terms of popularity, it's... That's really hard because it's the problem is that the download numbers in the package index there are well at most there are a rough indication but it's really hard to make big deductions from these numbers. I mean sometimes there are packages that cannot even be installed and they got downloaded like three thousand times. So how does this happen? It happens because there's all kinds of robots and. Some people have set up their continuous integration uh, framework in a broken way, so they download everything all the time, like every hour or something. And this and other effects, like especially robots, make it very hard to to know to to make deduct to deduce anything from the download numbers. I mean, PyTest is available in all Linux distributions, and um, there's certainly many many companies using it, but really exactly quantifying kind of like the market share is something I wouldn't I would like to do but I don't really know um, how to do actually 
can only use some some indications and so that remains maybe there could be some kind of poll or so that the Python Software Foundation could do in terms of, of uh, usage of testing tools I don't know but to my knowledge it's not really it's not really easily quantifiable you can certainly say that unit test and nose and pytest all are very popular but it's I think it's well, I don't really know how much more people use unit test than PyTest or how much more or less nose is used. used. It's really hard to know. I think in general, this is one of those things, adoption is one of those things that's virtually impossible to track. And the reason I say that is that every year or so, we see an article showing somebody who compiled statistics on language popularity by virtue of some index, like as a, for instance, projects on GitHub or check-ins on GitHub. And then it's like, okay, except that not everybody uses GitHub. As a matter of fact, uh, I can't think of his name. One of the Microsoft evangelists basically coined the term cold dark matter programmers. And it's, it's, it's because there's this huge universe of people out there who are using technology and tools that just don't participate. They make no noise. It's, it's you know, it's like you said about the people who, for every X people who use your tool, only one reports it. It's it's exactly the same kind of thing. You absolutely have no way of knowing. There are people in government. There are people in 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 circumstances where it's a completely closed environment, and you're you're never going to know. So this, I think, it's almost impossible to answer that question. At least precisely. I mean, you can get some ballpark ideas or so. But let me let me add something else about popularity because I encounter this uh, quite a lot nowadays. There's so many projects, software projects, and then when you actually want to determine what kind of web framework do I want to use, what kind of testing tool do I want to use, what kind of database do I want to use, and so on. I mean, there's all these kinds of questions that software developers have all the time, and one of the main strategies people are going about this complexity is looking at popularity because I think the reasoning is basically if something is more popular and I'm also using it I cannot be completely wrong about it right I mean there must be something to it if I'm using something that is less popular and it, it doesn't work for me then it's kind of like my fault but if everybody else is using it anyway then it cannot really be my fault right it's then it's basically I took the most popular solution, it doesn't work, so it's not really my problem. So there's this uh, psychological uh, thing about navigating the complexity of software choices by looking at popularity. And I think it's not actually a very good strategy. I mean, it certainly makes sense to look at a project. Is it maintained? Does it, are there some people, is there some kind of community? What are the values that uh, this project actually tries to to adhere to but the real thing I mean once you have basically you have this baseline and you have the impression okay this project is kind of alive and people are uh, and, and I like the way how they're doing it then you should not actually spend too much time thinking about the popularity thing but spend the time is it the right thing for us to use right so rather uh, that's basically my recommendation in general for any kind of software choice do make some 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 kind of general minimum things you want to see but then don't decide by popularity but decide if you think it really fits what you want to do so that's that's why i don't that's also a reason why i don't care too much about popularity and including in any way very hard to measure popularity numbers i also think that popularity is a poor indicator for what makes a good technology fit as just an example in the java world people used struts forever and hated it at least a lot of people hated it and i apologize if there are any struts project maintainers listening but there was a lot of discontent in the user community but because it was seen as an industry standard it got widely used and adopted and a lot of people probably would have been better off going with a different technology choice but didn't because it was seen as such a an industry standard 
One thing I will add about popularity as a means of choosing a given project, though, is that can be a potential indicator as to the level of support that you're likely to be able to achieve, whether it's through forums or Stack Overflow, or whether it's through having a company that will provide paid support for a given project, because that can definitely be a consideration when making those technology choices as well, and popularity can sometimes be a proxy for that. It can, yes. But sometimes you can also have the problem of something is very popular, but there's not actually too many people behind it. And that means the few maintainers, and that's also, I think, a problem in open source increasingly. We have very popular packages, but very few maintainers, sometimes even just one. And then they get swamped with all kinds of issues. The likeliness that you get some kind of fix or reaction with your problem thus this decreases with popularity. So it's certainly not just a matter of popularity, but that's what I meant by basically look at the community, look at how many people are there actually doing something. Um, that's probably uh, a better, I mean, when you, when you say, I mean, if you have like, for a, for a library, you have like three or four active maintainers, that's very, very good. You know, that's a very good uh, situation to be in because uh, most open source stuff has like one or at most two maintainers. So it's not like, it's, it's again not about having the most number of committers or something, but it's about having something healthy. And once you have like this minimal baseline of, of judging something as healthy, then you can check if it actually sweets and not just compare, like say the number of committers. So the one project might have 20 committers and the others 100, but that doesn't really matter that much. I mean, if from these 20, you have like three or four very dedicated people, Whereas in the under other case, from the 100 people, you only have like two very dedicated and the rest is just like minor PRs, then it's still not very um, comparing and saying the other one is like five times more interesting. doesn't really make much sense. Absolutely. I totally agree with what you're saying right there. Are there any features of PyTest that would make it suitable for use with configuration management tools and infrastructure testing? Well, I guess so. I haven't used it for that myself, but that's also because I'm not myself very much in the cloud business and, and DevOps things. What I think is where you can use it is to have kind of data and uh, example driven testing where you actually, for example, describe your tests in, in YAML files. So in some kind of markup language and and then you, you run PyTest to actually set up whatever, a virtual machine, configure some, some application, and then run some standard tests against it. You can use PyTest for that. Although, truth be told, I think that many of the features that you that PyTest has, you, you wouldn't use at that point in time. The only benefit there is that you can use the same tool for many different things. So it might be worth the effort to actually make it uh, to come up with some kind of scheme like the, the one person actually that did with uh, C++ to be able to have like one tool that you use for all kinds of different testing activities. But for these kind of like configuration management uh, situations, I wouldn't say that PyTest has like super distinctive features why you should use it there. But I might be wrong. I mean, maybe some people who actually use it see this differently, but I'm not the person to judge. So where do you see PyTest and more generally test frameworks headed in the future? I think testing tools in general, they have evolved quite a bit. PyTest certainly has, and the way how we are evolving things and is in making it easier and things more consistent and allowing certain usage patterns that haven't been possible before. But I don't expect any big changes. I think from at this point, it's really lots of uh, incremental things. And I expect like new plugins to actually add functionality, but not from the, from the core. The one thing where I think testing tools in general need to evolve, and you might know that I'm also the author of Tox, which is a testing tool that is independent of PyTest. It, you can run Nose and PyTest in all kinds of test runners. And it manages the creation of virtual environments and installing dependencies and then running things against different interpreters. And I think this kind of direction is, is where more things are bound to happen. One thing that I find interesting is that in no language that I know of, certainly not in Python, is it possible to, to express a testing need in the following terms. When I actually 
want to release a new version of my library. I want to have all of the dependent, all of the packages that actually depend on my library to rerun their test using my release candidate, right? I mean, for example, if you have like a certain parser for, for some kind of file format and other people are using, like a thousand projects are using your parser, then how do you actually say, oh, I have this new release candidate. Um, how can I now verify that it doesn't break? Lots of tools that actually successfully worked with the older version. And these kinds of questions, like the whole bigger picture of integration and uh, and release testing and and testing basically in a more complex world of dependencies, this is something where I expect improvements. And I think Travis and, and some other testing facilities, they don't really go there. They actually, they don't really know about basically the the Python uh, dependencies uh, between packages and stuff like this. And that's something that I'm personally uh, interested in, in, in working on. Uh, also because I maintain a number of tools and it, it becomes harder to actually, it's kind of like a lot of effort. We talked about this in terms of the plugins for PyTest itself to, to have some kind of quality guarantee that when I release something, I'm, I'm not uh, involuntarily accidentally breaking lots of stuff. So it's more these, these higher level questions of integration and testing of different packages against each other that uh, where, I, where I expect like more innovation possibilities and more new things to happen. Not so much um, in the running of, of tests itself. That being said, in PyTest, there's certainly room for optimizing, for example, distributing tests and making it quicker to actually to get very useful feedback when you are refactoring things. And there's there's some improvements there, but I, I would say like compared to the other area I just mentioned, it's more of an incremental improvements that we're going for there. There's no paradigm shift or anything like big new thing. Whereas in the other area, I think there's, there's room like for better and more tooling that would dramatically improve the, the usefulness of tests in terms of a whole software ecosystem. So integration testing frameworks in particular, something that I've been interested in recently as well, having tried to install and use Jenkins for managing the tests for my company and having a lot of headaches associated with that. So it's been on my mind for a little while to try and find the time to create a new integration testing server using something like Python or possibly even having a kernel written in Rust that does the execution and then having a web app built in Flask or Django built on top of that to provide an interface to users and again having that plug-in architecture so people can plug in whatever runners or language frameworks that they want to use to do that and one of the things that I find most particularly useful about integration testing servers is the ability to track code metrics over time and I haven't really found any services or tools or frameworks that really support that as a first-class citizen and a primary consideration. They generally seem to be bolted on after the fact, whereas I think that that's actually one of the more useful aspects of it, even beyond just being able to verify that the test's complete and that you can use a given tool alongside another given tool, because if you really want to, you can just do that on your own machine. But having a server with continuity and persistence is where the data story really becomes powerful and particularly with the recent resurgence and growth of data science and data analytics as a discipline having access to that data can really give you a lot of insights that are just locked up and you may have some potential intuition about but you don't have any hard answers when trying to make decisions about what is the best way to improve your code quality or changes that you might need to make in your overall software architecture to improve maintainability. So that's definitely a project that I would love to get started and potentially collaborate on. Yes, it's a somewhat complex project. I'm actually doing something in this area so in the last couple, two or three years uh, on and off. There's uh, the DevPy. DevPy is a packaging server that actually also stores test results. So when you run DevPy test, it actually, that's a subcommand then, it actually takes a package, it runs the test, it stores all kinds of meta information and then stores back the test results. So what you, what you get basically is if you look at the 
I can show you. You get a page like like this. I'm pasting this where you can see. Oh, here's my package, and I got all kinds of um, tests passing on Windows for Python 2.6, Python 3.4 for Linux, and so on. And basically, we want to from that side. We actually we want to enrich this data model that is behind that so that we also have the whole dependency information and can actually trigger tests. Um, I think it's a, it's a somewhat complex project. Also, especially in Python, there's the problem that it's not very trivial to actually know all of the dependencies. You usually only get that at install time. Like you can only see when you actually try to install a project, there's no declarative metadata describing what kind of dependencies you have. And that makes it harder to actually have this dependency tree and to know which package version depends on which other package version and so on. And that's part of the problem. There's some improvements going on in terms of Python packaging that allow this. But these days, it's still the case that most packages actually use setup.py for describing your package. And that is code. That is not a declaration of your dependencies. And that makes it very a lot harder for tools to process it because you need to actually run code and then figure out what happened. And that's something that makes it harder to actually to go for the goal we you also mentioned and, and I, uh, I want to go for as well. I think in other languages like in JavaScript, it's a bit easier because they have had from the start, they had declarative data formats that describe dependencies. So it's very easy to just pass all of these data formats and you, you have, a, have a more or less complete picture of how everything relates to each other. That being said, Python is more complex in JavaScript in terms of the platforms and the configurations in which you deploy it on. In JavaScript, you basically have Node.js on Unix machines and you have the browser and that's about it. Whereas in, uh, you have like all kinds of different Python interpreters and you have C extensions and all kinds of stuff that you can and also like 15 years worth of packages that exist already. So it's a bit of a different situation to work from. But this podcast podcast is it's not about packaging, so I'm going to stop here. It's 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 a whole it's a whole different thing, of course, to talk about you know, issues of packaging. But I think there's a relation between testing and, and packaging because if you can't automatically test your packages uh, in the relation to other packages, everything suffers. Like you you cannot really test what you want to test uh, the quality of the packages in terms of do they actually pass the tests uh, suffers. I think it is related and important, and, and I will also say two points. I think a number of people are coming to the same conclusions that both of you guys are with regards to the fact that the current generation of test running and management tools, a la Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera, it's like they're not up to the to the task of today's test management environment. That's one thing, and, and, and a lot of people are working on it. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of that and what might garner a lot of adoption and market share. The other thing is, I think a lot of people are aware that Python's packaging story is kind of rough. Uh, as a, for instance, languages like Go are gaining an awful lot of adoption simply by virtue of the fact that when you have your Go program, you can compile it into a binary that's completely standalone. You literally drop the binary on your system and away you go. There's no virtual ends. There's no packages that you need to install that it requires. You can just compile the thing into one binary blob, dump it where you need to go, and have it run. And I think, I think there's a lot of value to that. Right. Two things to that. Packaging has improved a lot, and I think uh, it's it's still improving. So the experience you get today is, I think, much better than what you got four or five years ago. And second, when it comes to standalone binaries, you can use CX Freeze or Py2 Exe. I think CX Freeze is also compatible to Python 3. And you can get the similar experience. It's just not advertised as a primary way, like from Python.org, to do things. But you can get the same thing. You know, people actually are using it. Dropbox, for example, there in the first couple of years, Dropbox was written in Python and they just used a binary. You didn't have to install any kind of virtual end for something. So of course you can do it, but it's not like a first class thing as it is in, in Go. But still it's very possible and I've done it myself. So I think in terms of packaging, Python is really, it's actually compared to other languages from what I get, it's actually not that bad anymore. Also when it comes to Go and even Node or so, I've heard 
friends of mine who are very deep in, in, in these languages, they have a lot of complaints about the packaging situation. So I think the problem with packaging is that packages are not created by the same, same persons all the time, but they're created by hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people across the world in all kinds of different situations. And there are so many things that, that people do that it's very hard to enforce any kind of strict way to, to normalized way to do something. But again, I think we are, we are basically going a bit too much into, into packaging. I think, I think we, we can probably agree that testing and the next, and that was the original question that you asked me. So what's the next thing with testing tools? And I, I think we can say that it's, uh, I can say that it's this kind of like these integrational aspects and better integration into higher level testing approaches is something that is needed. That's very interesting. So is there anything that we didn't ask you that we should have or anything that you would like to add or say to our listeners before we move to the picks? Maybe just, I just want to say that it's also important, I think, to, to see that PyTest currently has like, I would say, 10 kind of very active people uh, doing things, contributors and, and core committers. And that's something I'm very happy about, because like I said, in open source, it's not, these days, it's not so easy actually to get so many a -balls. like for, for the very popular packages maybe but for many projects it's very hard to even go beyond uh, one person as a main contributor and so i think the this kind of like situation I'm, i don't i mean i'm certainly still a person who's 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 doing a lot on pytest but there's really a number of other people who are also doing a lot and that is something i appreciate very much and it's, i think it's also important when you discuss a certain project to to talk about this so that's maybe the one thing that was a bit missing from the question so far about the uh, well basically about the other people and what's the what's the situation in terms of maintenance and, and people being involved with that we will move on to the picks my first pick along the lines of packaging is a project called pundler which is a play on bundler from ruby and it's a library that will allow you to define a gem file style file in your project so that you can then install all of your dependencies that way and freeze them and provide different versions without necessarily having to take advantage of virtual end. So it's just a potential alternative to the requirements.txt style format. So definitely worth taking a look at. My next pick is Python Future, which is a library that will make it easier to convert a Python 2 code base to Python 3 using the 2 to 3 library as well as adding some other niceties on top of that. I recently converted a library that I take advantage of for my work to Python 3. It was almost there, but there were still some things that needed to be modernized, and that helped me a lot in doing a lot of the manual drudgery of just converting imports and print statements, etc. So definitely take, worth taking a look there, and in conjunction with that, the sixth library, because that was very helpful as well. My next pick is the movie The Way Back, which is a movie about some prisoners in a Siberian prison camp in World War II who managed to escape and walk about 4,000 miles from, the, from northern Siberia all the way to India, crossing the Gobi Desert and the Himalayas, and it was just a very well done movie, very interesting story, so well worth a watch. I'll also pick Pip Dep Tree, which is a utility that will print out your installed packages in a dependency hierarchy, because sometimes when you type pip freeze, you get a whole bunch of packages and you say, well, I didn't install all of those manually. I want to know which ones are actually the top level and which ones are all installed as dependencies. And that lets you do that so that you can end up with a much cleaner requirements.txt file without necessarily having to list everything that you install because some of that may change over time. And my last pick is the Rosewill BK500A and also the i, which is a Bluetooth keyboard for use with Android and also potentially iPhone or iPad that I recently picked up for using with my NVIDIA Shield tablet so that I can work on blog posts, or I also have a contained CH-rooted Linux environment on my tablet, so 
having a physical keyboard is really useful for being able to interact with that or write blog posts or just do some other things without necessarily having to haul around my laptop. And I tried a couple other Bluetooth keyboards before I landed on this one, and I'm really happy with it. It's got a couple of little pop-out pieces that will let you use it as a stand for your tablet as well, so definitely worth checking out. And that is it for me. So Chris, go ahead. Uh, my first pick is, as usual, a beer pick. Uh, we were in Vermont this last weekend in the Stowe area, and there's a really great um, brew house, brewery there, Crop uh, Brew Pub, uh, and they make a Bavarian Weizen that I actually think is better than uh, a lot of the ratings that I'm seeing out there in a number of the beer rating uh, sites. It's a little bit fruity, very crisp, really delicious. I like it. The next pick that I have is... And I'm not going to try to pronounce the actual name for these because it sounds vaguely rude in English. And also, I'm sure I would horribly screw it up. But Dutch pancakes. Um, these are something that I had never encountered before until, again, in the, in the Stowe area, there's a, a restaurant called the Dutch Pancake Cafe. And they are pancakes not like not at all like the traditional sort of American things that you put maple syrup on and nothing else. Uh, these things are whole plate sized crepes for lack of a better way to describe it. And they are savory as well as sweet. You can put various vegetables and bacon and all kinds of really good stuff in them. And they are delicious. My wife and I need to investigate making these. I'm told it's not hard, but they are really a tasty treat and more Americans should try them. My last pick is a graphic novel series. I hesitate to use the word comic because once again, you know, this is not men in tights romping around saving the world. There are some fairly serious themes being dealt with here called Profit. And uh, this is just a really unique series from stem to stern. The artwork is incredibly creative and beautifully drawn. Uh, the story writing is very interesting and postulates a very far future in which I won't spoil anything, but humanity has undergone some really incredible changes Unlike a lot of science fiction that I've found where aliens are, are really quite a lot like us with only very minor modifications, the world that Prophet inhabits is very, very, very different. The writing is very good. It's a really great story arc. There's a lot of it. I've, I've only been through the first two volumes and I definitely look forward to reading more. It's just, it, if you like science fiction, you should definitely be reading it. Whether you think of yourself as someone who reads comics or not, it's, it's top notch. That's it for me. Holger, what do you have for us? Well, I wasn't actually aware. I was. Uh, I didn't actually think about any kind of picks because uh, the picks are basically something recommendations, like general recommendations on, on, on something. Yeah, it can, be, it can be anything that you like and you think listeners might enjoy. It can be food, beer, a book you've read, a movie you've watched, a technology that you've used. I see. The uh, I can I can say that I was uh, there's a book called The Utopia of Rules from David Graeber, which is also about technology and uh, bureaucracy topics, and I enjoyed this very much. David Graeber is an anthropologist who discusses more or less like a couple of thousand years of um, human history and comes up with uh, with a criticism of our current times, which I find very interesting and um, especially also in in terms of what we are doing with respect to bureaucracies and technology. So that's something I can recommend. Um, the other thing which I think is very interesting, and that's something I'm also going to talk about in my keynote at EuroPython, which is the Interplanetary File System, IPFS.io. It's kind of like rethinking a bit how we are doing networking because we are still kind of using the old telephone model TCP IP that was developed 45 years ago in the beginning of the 70s. Um, and I think there's some very good ideas in IPFS, but you can also probably watch my, my keynote about this. So I'm, I'll just leave it at that, um, because like I said, I wasn't really prepared. Those are, those are two great picks, Holger. No, no worries there. It's interesting that you bring up IPFS. I had not actually heard about that, but I definitely agree. We're, we are definitely suffering with some really, really early decisions in networking that just don't make any sense anymore. Like as a, for instance, even IPv4 versus IPv6, right? I'm, I'm seeing people scramble and I'm seeing various projects to deal with the fact that 
even you know large organizations now are running out of IPv4 addresses. And it's just so silly because v6 solves all these problems, but because of you know devices with their IP stacks in in firmware, people are just not adopting it. Yes. Well, I think a very good uh, one of the persons uh, who has explored this since a couple of years and who has been very deep in TCP IP for like two decades or three decades is Mr. Van Jacobsen. If you look for Van Jacobsen, I have to look for, for the right uh, slides and the keyword name data networking, you will find some very interesting information in terms of how did TCP IP actually come to exist, what was it modeled on, and why doesn't it fit anymore. And HTTP being based on TCP IP kind of like suffers from similar problems. But it's a, it's a wide ranging discussions and uh, that's something I also want to get involved in where I think that it would be interesting for Python people also to be more involved in. Well, we'd like to thank you very much, Holger, for taking the time to speak with us today. It has been a very interesting and informative discussion, and I'm sure our listeners will really appreciate listening to it. So for anybody who would like to follow you and what you've been up to and some of the projects you work on, what would be the best way for them to do that? I guess my Twitter and blog, like Twitter is, uh, is this, HPK42, and my blog is... Uh, my full name like this http holgercrickle.net. Well, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Tobias and Chris.